Er lebt noch. Schade. Engländer, komm raus und halte die Hände hoch. Mein Name ist Peter Binner. Mein Rank ist Lieutenant Royal Flying Corps, Squadron 19. And don't you bloody call me an Englishman. Mr. Standfast by John Buchan. Dramatized in two parts by Bert Cools. Episode 1. I'd started out in khaki in 1914 with nothing more than a great wish to see the whole business finished. But after three years, I'd acquired a professional interest in the thing. I had a nailing good brigade and a chest so full of gongs it looked like the high priest's breastplate. So you can imagine the infamous temper I was in at being recalled to England. So, how was the song? You came out of it with a DSO. And a promotion. Brigadier General Richard Hannay. Mm. Walter, is there a point to this? Frankly, I don't take kindly to being called away from my men when we're on the brink of a big push. Of course there's a point, and you know it. We want you back in with us. Huh? The old game. No, I've told you, I'm not cut out for the Secret Service. There must be someone better suited. N not for this mission. Now, stop wasting time. Duty's duty, and we both know perfectly well that you're going to say yes. Hell and damnation! <sighs> what Sir Walter Bullivan wanted me to do would have been bad enough for anyone. But for me, strong as a bull, sunburnt as a gypsy, and not looking my 40 years, it was a black disgrace. My stomach rose at the thought of it. Fighting the Germans is pointless. I, I simply don't understand why we're doing it. It's so good to meet another kindred spirit. Our own tiny pacifist community, all in revolt against this ludicrous war. What is your particular stance, Mr. Brand? Well, I believe that a little common sense and um, civilised discussion would settle it right away. With a little common sense and civilised discussion, it would never have started in the first place. Ah, Lancelot. Just in time for dinner, clever boy. Our cousin, Mr. Brand. Lancelot Wake. Mr. Cornelius Brand. Wake? Brand. Good evening. I'm sure you two men will have so much in common. Lancelot's a CEO. A conscientious objector. Well, that explained the sallow skin, the fanatical eyes, and the fact that he'd rather more hair on his head than most of us. You know, Mr. Brown, no one's done better work for the cause than Lancelot. The questions have been asked about him in Parliament. Well, someone has to bring the truth to light. The truth? About our senior officers. Incompetent, stupid or drunk, the lot of them. You agree, of course. I've heard something of the sort. Oh, it's perfectly true. And it's not just in the field. The people running this war seem to think the whole thing's some sort of game. A game? <laughs> Ah, that's uh, terrible. Simply terrible. That dinner seemed to last for an eternity. But at last the creature left, the ladies went off to bed, and I was alone and able to calm my nerves. <sighs> Beyond the terrace the lawn fell away, white in the moonshine to a miniature lake. By the water's edge was a small formal garden with grey stone parapets which gleamed like dusky marble. Great wafts of scent rose from it, for the lilacs were scarcely over and the May was in full blossom. And I understood all over again what a precious thing this little England was, how old and kindly and comforting, and how worth fighting for. Cherry ripe, cherry ripe, ripe. 
Good Lord. She was down in the little garden, whoever she was. And as I peered through the twilight, she came out into sight. Tall, slender, very young, and breathtakingly lovely. She moved with all the free grace of an athletic boy. Cherry ripe, cherry ripe, ripe I cry. Fool and fair ones come and buy. Good evening. Good evening, sir. That was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, forgive me, but um, who are you? Mary Lamington. I live here. You do? The ladies who entertained you tonight are my aunts. Ah. And, um, do you share their views? Don't you mean our views? They told me you're a pacifist too, Mr Cornelius Brandt. Uh, well, uh, uh, yes, that's right. I, I am. Right. No, my attitude is rather different. But don't you find it awkward, then, living here with them? It's worth it. They're my camouflage. Your what? Shall we talk about it indoors? General Hane? Here. Thank you. Look. What's troubling you, General? Well, all right. You know my real name. But how can I be sure it's safe for me to talk to you? <laughs> Walter said you'd be cautious. Well, forgive me, but you could be an enemy agent in disguise. You're right, I could. Very well. Let me prove my credentials. Three days ago, you were ordered to change your identity, correct? Correct. You're a pacifist South African engineer over here on holiday, and a mutual friend asked my aunts to put you up for the night while you visit a sick relative. Yes. <laughs> Not enough. How about this? In your pocket, you have a personal letter from your oldest and closest friend, a South African tracker named Peter Pienaar, who joined the Royal Flying Corps. <sighs> I can tell you the contents, including the sad news about his leg. Are you willing to trust me now? With all my heart. Thank you. Now, Walter told you to expect further orders. Yes. Here they are. Firstly, you're to continue with your deception. Well, I'd hoped that was just for tonight. I'm afraid not. It would help if I knew why I was doing it. Because you must. I can't tell you any more than that, I'm sorry. Very well. What else? Peter Pina used to talk about getting the atmosphere of a situation. How the devil do you know that? It's not important. That's your next task. Getting atmosphere. Absorbing the feel of a particular way of life. The pacifists. Exactly. The half-baked. The people this war hasn't touched. Or has touched in the wrong way. And where do I get this atmosphere? Some rooms have been rented out in your name in a town in the home counties. Here's the address. Thank you. You're to leave at first light tomorrow. Oh, one more thing. Buy a copy of Pilgrim's Progress, the Golden Treasury edition. Have you read it? Oh, in school, of course. Read it again. Why? Oh, can't you tell me that either? Because it's a very good book. And because you might well find it useful. That's all for now. You'll be given more specific instructions when the time's right. Good night, Mr. Brand. Uh, Miss Lamington, wait. What? Will you answer one question? That depends on what it is. Shall I see you again? Oh, yes. We're comrades now. Good night. Good night. Good night. Well, Dick, the Bosch doctors just told me he can't save my leg. No more hunting for me, I guess, or flying either. But they're treating us pretty well, and the smell of the woods behind the prison camp reminds me of home. So I reckon I could be a lot worse off. <sighs> that dreadful news, mentioned so casually, had made me forget the rest of the letter. But now something struck my eye. There's not much to do here, Dick, so I've been getting in some reading. <laughs> Bet you're surprised, eh? 
I had my Bible, of course, and someone's given me another book that's just as good. Pilgrim's Progress, it's called. I reflected on how life throws up these little coincidences. And with that thought, and with the image of the girl who'd sung in the golden twilight filling my mind, I retired to my bed, oddly comforted and ready for whatever was to come. Morning, Brand. Beautiful day. Morning, Weeks. Lovely. Shall you be at Ursula's lecture tonight? I wouldn't miss it. I do so admire Ursula Jimson. So John esque in her line, so ooh, full of nuances. Ah, uh, rather. The Garden City of Biggleswick. I think it was home to every damned pacifist in the Empire. This place is one great laboratory of thought, Mr. Brand. The intellectual history of England is being made here. God help England. But I had my orders. Absorb the atmosphere. I walked with painters, drank with novelists, and discussed politics with conches. And I went to their lectures in the local hall. A sort of church for the undevout. Thank you very much, my friend. Thank you. It turned out that Lancelot Wake was a star turn there. They loved him. Congratulations, Wake. That was jolly good. You made a lot of sense. Yes, I did. And I hear you've been coming on a good deal yourself. Yeah. Ah, Ivory. A first class evening, Wake. Thank you. Uh, do you know Cornelius Brand? I certainly do. Mox and Ivory, the local big cheese. They loved him, too, the Biggles Wickians. No, that's not right. They worshipped him, with his pamphlets, his articles, his talks, his ridiculous societies, and his endless pronouncements about universal brotherhood and goodwill. He was the god of academic pacifism. Ah, that's better. Now, Mr. Brand, uh, I've been meaning to have a private word. Too kind, Mr. Ivory. Uh, I've been struck by your grip on these difficult problems. You may be of great value to our cause. You really think so? I'm sure of it. A League of Democrats Against Aggression would have a valuable new member in your good self. Yes. The League of Democrats Against Aggression. <laughs> After weary weeks of enduring this sort of rubbish, I was convinced that my great mission was nothing more than a farce. Until one night, everything changed. Well done, Brad. You really livened up the discussion. Good of you to say so. I appreciate it. Now, now there, 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 there's someone you should meet. I don't know if I can find her. I, uh, my dear, uh, come and say hello. This is Cornelius Brand. Good evening, Mr. Brand. Good evening. Moxon has told me so much about you. Really? Yes. Oh, honestly, Moxie, you might introduce me properly. I was sorry to miss you when you stayed with my aunts last month, Mr. Brand. Mary Lamington. Pleased to know you, Miss Lamington. Likewise, sir. She unwound herself from Ivory's arm, and I tried to convince myself that this was just more of her camouflage. Then we shook hands, and I felt a small slip of folded paper being pressed into my palm. In two days' time, go up to London and visit Trail's Bookshop in the Haymarket. Get there at two. Destroy this note. <laughs> the game was afoot at last. Good afternoon, Mr. Brand. Good afternoon. Welcome to Trails Bookshop. Thank you. Are the managers expecting you, sir? First door at the top of the stairs. Mm -hmm. 
Well, well. Mr. Trail, I presume? Come in, Dick. Lock it too, please. I know you're a man of many parts, Walter, but manager of a bookshop? Don't be absurd. Me absurd? Why have you brought me here? Well, because it wouldn't do to have Cornelius Brand calling on me in Whitehall, of course. Now, take a seat and tell me what you found in Biggles' wick. <clears throat> a lot of ignorance and a large slice of vanity. Why the devil have I been wasting my time there? But you haven't. What if I were to tell you that high-level war secrets are finding their way to Berlin and there's nothing we've been able to do about it? I'd be amazed. Some foreign agents managed to escape the entire British Secret Service. Oh, we know who's responsible. Well, well then why don't you stop him? Well, we don't want to. Not until we found out just how he's getting the information out of the country. Why wait until then? Because we want to use the same route ourselves. Ah. Feed Berlin lies they'll take for gospel and watch them throw vital resources into dead ends. Mm, clever. I thought so. Now, your mission. Now, take a good look at this. Nose like a Polish Jew. Is this your master spy? No, but he has close links with him. That's Abel Gressel. He's another pacifist. He doesn't exactly look the part. Yes, he's rather more militant about it than your recent acquaintances. He's the leader of a subversive organisation called Industrial Workers of the World. <laughs> Mm, they were responsible for some very nasty cases of sabotage in Colorado. He's an American. Mm. And just before the beginning of the leaks, he turned up on this side of the Atlantic. In Scotland, to be precise. You think he's part of the chain? We suspect he's the final link before the Germans. Your job is to find out exactly what he's up to. But if your own people haven't been able to ferret out the details, why on earth do you think I'll do any better? Well, because you can get a lot closer to Gresson than we can. Fellow pacifists and all that. So that's why I've gone over to the enemy. What else can you tell me about him? Well, not much, I'm afraid. We've been keeping an eye on him, of course, but he knows all the tricks and we haven't dared risk a proper shadow. But we do know that he tends to disappear for weeks at a time. So I have to discover where he goes and what he does there. Precisely. And Dick? Mm hmm Mr. Abel Gresson is an exceedingly dangerous individual. Be very careful. Andrew Amos, the agent Walter had appointed to be my contact in Glasgow. A tiny man with smouldering eyes, hands like a gorilla's, and a surprising hobby. Some men say their prayers, but I like a tune. The principle's the same. Now, Mr. Brand, about your man Gresson. He's sailing on Friday as purser aboard a boat called the Tobermory. Is he, by God? She wanders every month up the West Highlands as far as Stornoway. Does he do this trip regularly? Well, that I can't say. Well, still a lot more than London knew. How did you find out? Well, I have ways and means of my own. Come on, get your hat. Where are we going? Don't you want to take a look at the man? Can I do that? I thought he'd be keeping his head down. Not exactly. Well, there he is. Not going down too well, is he? Dear God, they're going to kill him. No, he's away. Look. Where does that door lead? There's an alleyway at the back. Stay here. Mr. Gresson! Who in the hell are you? I was in the hall. You're going to show me the error of my ways, are you? Actually, I'm on your side. Shouldn't you be getting away? Nah, I got enough friends in there to stop the stampede. They'll block the door. And suppose some of the others decide to come round from the front like I did. Is that likely? There he is. Uh, yes, I'd say it is. Hi, oh, Cam. Come on, Jimmy. Can you use your fists, Gresson? Don't need to. I got this. Put that away, you idiot. Get behind me. Stay beside your lads. You know quite a eat. Go home, you fools. Leave this gentleman alone. <laughs> fools, is it? I think you need to learn some manners, Lordy. Oh, oh. 
stone, stone, take it like a man. I don't want to hurt you. <laughs> but if it's the only way. <laughs> oh. ah! All right, my friend. Oh. Your turn. You stuck up, Sazanak. <laughs> Is that the best you can do? <laughs> well, neatly done, sir. Ah, the local constabulary. I suggest we beat a quick retreat. Sounds good. I guess I'm in your debt, Mr. Uh... The name's Brand. Cornelius Brand. Uh, here. Scotch whiskey. Second finest in the world. Thanks. Good health. Mud in your eye. Hmm. So, you're on my side, are you? Pacifist all my adult life. <laughs> How's it feel to be in a minority? Well, I'm used to it. Yeah, I guess you would be. You live here in Glasgow? No, I'm just visiting. From down south? Actually, I'm, I'm just visiting there, too. I'm over from South Africa. Holiday? Partly. Mostly, I'm working for the cause. I've been staying in Bigglesworth. Can't say I've heard of it. Oh, you'd like it. It's full of our sort of people. So, why are you up here? My ancestors fought with Bonnie Prince Charlie. I want to see the place where he left for France. And some of the other sites, too, of course. Do you believe in fate, Mr. Brand? No, I don't. Well, a coincidence, then? Maybe. Why? Because I reckon I'm the very man to help you on your way. To the good ship Tobomori. Thanks so much for arranging this. I gather that passengers aren't exactly the main priority. You've seen the sleeping accommodation. I've inspected my shelf in the corner of the saloon, yes. <laughs> Do you mind? Not in the slightest. It's not as if I can run to anything much grander. And besides, it's worth it just to get away for a while. What's the timetable? Oh, there isn't one. We just mosey around the West Highlands, picking up and dropping off. What sort of cargo? Just about anything. Yeah, by this time tomorrow, we could be sharing the deck with a dozen sheep and a couple of goats. And you're part of the crew? Mm-hmm. Purser. That doesn't pay much, but it helps keep body and soul together. And it's a hell of a lot better than being stuck away in an office somewhere. Amen, my friend. I was feeling pretty damn pleased with myself. After I'd saved Gresson from his thrashing, we talked well into the small hours on every aspect of the blasted anti-war movement, and my disguise had held up perfectly. I never thought I'd say it, but three cheers for Biggleswick and the education it had given me. Sooner or later, on one of our stops, Gresson would be leaving the boat to pass on the latest batch of military secrets. I had a shrewd notion how he'd be doing it. North of these parts, there were some fine, deep bays, just perfect for an enemy submarine to pop up at night and send a boat ashore. All I had to do was stick to Gresson like glue, and nothing in the world was going to stop me doing exactly that. Take a look at your passport now, Mr. Brand. Captain? Uh, your passport, sir. You, you do have one. Well, of course I do, but why on earth do you want to see it? No, 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 sir. Your, your, your local passport. Uh, the paperwork for this trip, uh, they'll no let you go ashore north of Fort William without you have a passport. Well, I had no idea. Well, so you, you didn't have one? No, I don't. Oh, well, it's too late now. You should have applied to the military gentleman in Glasgow, I'm afraid. You, You'll just have to sit on this deck and admire the works of God from afar. Oh, that's a, a poor job, Mr. Brown. Yes, I'm afraid so. Problem? How many stops before Fort William? Two. Why? Well, they'll be my last chance to go ashore. No papers. <laughs> Is that all? 
Come on. Men like us don't put much stock in governments and their two-cent laws. The police up here are hayseeds. I reckon it'd be a fine game to see just how far you could get. No, I'm not out for sport. I'm gonna have to change my plans. How in the name of heaven could I shadow Gresson if I was stuck on board the damn boat? I was still trying to come up with a scheme when we reached the first of our two stops, the clean little town that was Oban. I made a beeline for the post office to see if Andrew Amos's ways and means of my own had turned up anything new for me. P117 stop, P3 stop, AA. What the devil? <gasps> ah! It's a very good book. And it might well prove useful. Ha. Page 117, paragraph 3. One, two, ah. Then I saw in my dream that a little off the way, over against the silver mine, stood a man who called to those passing to come and see the mine. Ah, Mr. Brand. Captain. How do you like Oban? I like it fine, thank you. Uh, it has a grand setting. There's copper in those hills. I put money on it. Oh, you, you know about such things? I'm a mining engineer. Maybe after the war, I'll come back here and try some prospecting. Ah, uh, well, you'll make nothing of it. No? No one ever has. The costs are all big. So it's never been tried? Not anywhere up here? Only one place I can of. The old iron mines at Rana, up Fornant Sky. Do we call her? Aye. Every trip. And we always bide a bit. But you'll not be seeing those mines, Mr. Brand. Rana's well inside the passport country. And perfect for a secret meeting with the enemy. The people passing by. I wondered how the deuce Amos had found out about it, but decided I didn't much care. He'd saved me a lot of tedious work. Now all I had to do was get to Rana without alerting Gresson. Man, that's got to be one hell of a walk. Up Morven, round the head of Loch Eel, and straight back down to Oban. Should be a smashing hike, and all legal, too. Well, I've said my say on that matter. What will you do after that? Back to Glasgow and some work for the cause. Yeah, it's a great life, if you don't weaken. <laughs> Good luck to you, Brand. Thanks. I'm sorry to see you go. Goodbye, Gresson. It's been a real pleasure. Bye. See you again. Maybe. <laughs> If you're no Once I was out of sight of the shore, I turned due north and struck over the shoulder of a great hill. And from that point on, I was breaking the law. I can't say I let it bother me. The air was crisp and clean. The landscape was pure delight. And when I stopped for a bite to eat, I had a wonderful vista of heather and bog myrtle and wood and water below me. Funny thing, though, I adored Scotland and always had. But now, for some reason, I found my thoughts straying elsewhere. Cherry ripe, cherry ripe, ripe I cry. Fool and fair ones come and buy. What the devil? Stay exactly where you are, sir. Put your hands in the air. For God's sake, man! You might have killed me! Come here, Rock. You know a warning shot when you see one? What's your name? What business is it of yours? I'll tell you. I'm Colonel George Broadbury, the deputy lieutenant of this county. And a man on a walking tour is a threat, is he? 
He is when he's Cornelius Brand. What? Who, who the devil's he? Damn it, sir. I've had a wire from the chief constable about you. Middle height, strongly built, grey tweeds, brown hat, sunburnt. You're a very dangerous figure. My orders are to arrest you and take you back to Oban. I, I beg your pardon, Deputy Lieutenant. I'm not used to being pulled up suddenly in question. My name's Blakey. Captain Robert Blakey of the Scots Fusiliers. Home on three weeks' leave. And how the deuce am I to be satisfied about that? Ah, by George, I know. Put your hands down. You're coming home with me. Some more wine, Captain Blakey. Thank you, Colonel. Ted? Rather. Thank you, Colonel. I'm sorry about the mix-up, Captain. You have to admit, you fit the description. Oh, come on, Pa. So do most of the coves on walking tours up here. Grey tweeds, brown hat and sunburnt. That's practically a uniform. <laughs> The police might have been a touch more specific. Well, I'm sure they did the best they could. Anyway, your father was quite right to challenge me. What's he done, this brand chap? Can't tell you, old man. Security and all that. Mm, something serious, though, by the sound of it. Are there any search parties out? Roadblocks? Could be. Why are you so interested? Oh, I don't know. Always fun to have a bit of excitement to spice up one's leave. I'll tell you this. If you had been brand and you'd made a run for it... I'd have been well within my rights to shoot you. Good job the boy here says you're pucker. I knew he'd be able to tell a real soldier from a blasted fake. Hmm. But what a fantastic coincidence that you actually know people from my outfit, sir. Not really. Your brigade was just across the river from mine at Arras. It was good to hear news from the front. Maybe I'll be back there soon. I mean, if this blasted leg heals properly. Looks well on the way to me. Thanks, sir. I have to thank you too, Blakey. <laughs> For what, Colonel? For cheering up the boy. He was moping a good bit. Your coming's been a godsend. Which is how I came to spend that night between clean sheets and to eat a Christian breakfast. I set off next morning, offering silent thanks to the old colonel for respecting a fellow officer and not bothering to ask for my papers, and wondering just why Cornelius Brandt was so suddenly a wanted man. After four days of weary tramping, I finally pitched up on the slopes of a black mountain cliff, in a landscape like nothing else I'd ever seen. In the jagged shadows of the fading daylight, the scars of the abandoned mining works turned the place into some nightmare primeval realm, uncanny and unearthly. It was a fitting location for treacherous deeds. Across a narrow stretch of water lay the Tobomori, and there, right below me, was Gresson, walking straight for the cliff face. My nerves were tight, and I got quite a shock when he suddenly disappeared right in front of my eyes. Then I pulled myself together. A cave. He's waiting in a cave, of course. Good God above. Wake. Brand. What the devil are you doing here? So you're part of this business, are you? I should have known. What business? Wake. Listen. Listen. I'm involved in this too. In what? I'm working with Gresson, just the same as you. Who's Gresson? <laughs> you're not making any sense, old man. I'm just here to do a spot of climbing. You can drop the act. I tell you we're on the same side. Gresson's down there now, and I'm on lookout. We're waiting for the submarine. The submarine? To collect the information for Berlin. My God. You're a bloody traitor. You damnable braggart! No, wait. Uh, for Christ's oh, sake. You were a patriot. So will you stop this? Oh, what about your principles? This I should me. never have trusted you. I made a mistake. Uh, wait. Uh, sorry about this. Oh. Oh. Now, for heaven's sake, shut up and listen. Why should I? Because I'm the worst kind of idiot. What? Give me a hand, man. Let me help you up. Yeah, I can manage on my own. Thank you. 
Oh! Right. Now, will you kindly explain to me what the deuce this is all about? And I did. I told him everything. By the time I'd finally managed to convince him, it was almost completely dark. So you're a soldier? Yes. And you know how I feel about all that. You want an end to the war? Help me down these devils. Right. What do you want me to do? Well done, the pacifist. Wake had spotted the German sub breaking surface the other side of the headland. I pulled back even further into the tiny pitch-black crevice by the mouth of the cave and hoped I wouldn't have to wait long. I didn't. In the forest, the little birds fall silent. Just wait, for soon you two shall be at rest. Welcome, friend. You have the goods? Yes. Excellent. I bring you a message. The caged birds understand. And the wild birds? The wild birds fly free. They're obsessed with bally birds. Code names of some sort. The, the password to poetry. Poetry? Haven't you read Goethe? <sighs> Not a word. It's pretty poor stuff, judging by that. Uh, you need to hear it in the original. Die Vögel ein Schweigen im Walde. Oh, for God's sake, wake up the Wanderer's Night Song. Did you hear anything else? Yes. A name, I think. Baumertz. Yeah. Baumertz. Mean anything to you? Afraid not. Was that it? No. There was one more thing. Something vital. Uh, pretty soon it's gonna get harder to fix up these meetings. Take a look at this. What is that? Safe hiding place. Now I can leave the stuff in there for you to pick up when you can. <laughs> a nice dry little cup of our birdseed, eh? Most ingenious. <laughs> After they'd gone, I took a look. Did you find their hidey hole? <sighs> Blind man could have followed their spore. They might just as well have left a signpost. Yes, I found it. It's exactly what I was after. So, what now? We let Gresson get well clear of here. I don't know about you, but I could do with a pipe, a bite to eat, and a good night's sleep. I'll give you your orders in the morning. Ready? Ready. Oh. <laughs> Just the thing, eh? Oh, yes. You don't get this in Biggleswick. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I say, Bran, look. Isn't that a destroyer? Yes. Heading south. You don't think that Bosch sub's still out there somewhere? No. No. They'll be well on their way home now with their prize. Come on. We can dry off in the sun. Right, I'm ready. Have you finished? Here. That's a map of the area, a diagram of the cave and the hiding place, and everything I've learned about Gresson. What about the conversation? The passwords? No, that's not there. Why not? I ran out of paper. Besides, I don't want to put all my eggs in the same basket. Mm. Repeat your orders. I'm to deliver this to Andrew Amos in Glasgow, speed being of the essence. Good. Look, why aren't you coming with me? I'd slow you down. I can't travel openly. Really? Is that because of the stage, Ori? What do you mean? Your togs, old man. 
Frankly, you look slightly less respectable than Charlie Chaplin. Oh, uh, hadn't occurred to me. No, that's not it. Oh, well, your business, not mine. What will you do after Glasgow? Back here? No. This place has lost its sanctity. I'll be going home. Hmm. I'll get to Amos as quickly as I can. Here's something to think about on the way. Last night, you were in the front line. No, more than that. You were in no man's land, face to face with the enemy. You went over the top. That's one way of looking at it. Well, good luck to you, Hannay. One last thing. Yes? If anyone tries to take that map, eat it. My journey back down south was a curious affair. Now that my mission was accomplished, I set off with my heart light, reveling in the challenge of being the hunted rather than the hunter for a change. But eventually the reality of my situation washed away the thrill of the chase. I found myself reduced to sleeping in the shadows by day and creeping along deserted byways by night, no better than the lowest sort of common criminal. Amos. Amos. Oh, for pity's sake, wake up! You damn heathen! Quiet, man. It's me. Is that right? Wait, wait. That's better. Oof, man, you're not very respectable in your appearance. What? What have you done to your bricks and bits? Never mind that. Did you get the papers? Are they safe? Uh, aye, aye, they are. They're heading to their destination in sure hands. Thank God. Uh, your man with the extravagant hair said you had information in your heat to get to London. Yes. You don't find that easy. You're wanted by the law on both sides of the border. In England, too? You're posted as a dangerous criminal. What have you been doing? Walking the Highlands without any papers. This goes way beyond that, I'm thinking. Well, there's been nothing else. Then you've powerful enemies somewhere. Still, there's no sense in fretting. There's more urgent things to attend to. You need a change of clothes and a new identity. And a good wash, if you don't mind me saying it. Hmm. I'll see what I can arrange. Which is how I came to be, Private Henry Tompkins, the 12th Blasters. I was in the uniform of a British private, complete down to the shapeless boots and the dropsical puttees. My hands were hard and rough and only needed some grubbiness and hacking about the nails to pass muster. With my cap on the side of my head, a pack on my back, a service rifle in my hands, and my pockets bursting with penny picture papers, I was the very model of the British soldier returning from leave. I also had a packet of woodbine cigarettes and a hunch of bread and cheese for the journey. And I had a railway warrant made out in my name for London. God only knows how Amos had done it. further inside. Oh, no, they want to watch. Not blame them. Is anybody hurt? Oh. Excuse me. Excuse me. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. Just a little shaken. What about you? You're bleeding. Hold a bit of glass, old boy. Show me. No, it's not too bad. Give me your hat. Big pardon. Hold it there. Oh. Press down. Uh. Harder. Uh. 
That'll stop it till you get some proper help. Oh, thank you. Anyone seriously hurt? Oh, Oliver, there's a man in the okay, back. Where? Yeah. Let me through. Let me through. You don't know what's wrong with him. There's no blood. No, it could be shock. Now listen to me. You're safe in here. Nothing can hurt you here. He tried that, mate. He just lies there. Help me turn him over. Don't think he'll let us. Well, we won't know unless we try, will we? Come on, old chap. Oh, no. No, no, no. Don't fight me, man. Let me see if you're all right. That's the way. You ready? Right, you ask why. One, two, three. <sighs> Good Lord. It's you. All right. Lie still. Let's have a look. No. I don't think you're badly injured. Oh, my God. My God. What's wrong with him? Is it bad? Is it... Get out of my way. Oh. Out of my way. Oh. Oh. Keep him here. Right. He mustn't be moved. Oh. Will you let me through? Oh. Oh. Hey, you! Get back inside! What? No, I can't. You'll do as you're told, soldier boy. You want to get yourself killed? Look, Constable, I have to get to Westminster. No, it's too late. He'll be at home. I have to get to Queen Anne's Gate. That's not a place for the likes of you. I want your name and number. Oh, for pity's sake. All right. Here are my papers. Hurry, please. Hmm. Driver Henry Tompkins, 12 Gloucesters. Satisfied now? Can I go? Oh, I'm not going anywhere, you bleeding coward. You're on the list as a deserter. Who's in charge here? I am. What can I do for you? You can explain to me why you're detaining Brigadier General Richard Hannay on some damn fool trumped-up charge. Yeah, well, he says he's a brigadier, but that don't make him one. How do you know about it, anyway? I know because he bribed one of your cleaners to make a phone call. Now, you listen to me. I am Sir Walter Bullivant, and I can have the Chief Constable here in ten minutes if I so choose. And if Dick Hannay doesn't walk through that door in less than 60 seconds, that's exactly what I shall do. Am I making myself perfectly clear? <laughs> No, I rather enjoyed that. Brought back memories. Walter, listen. Yeah, excellent work, by the way. I've got your report, first class. Walter, something's happened. Something terrible. No, what are you talking about? While the raid was on, I sheltered in Hoban Station. And? There was a man in shock. I tried to help him. Very commendable. Yeah. The strange thing was, I knew him. Recognised him as soon as I turned him over. It was Moxon Ivory. Go on. Well, then, as I looked at him, his face changed. Changed? I know, it sounds fantastic, but I swear to you, it's true. Right in front of my eyes, he changed completely. No, I, I don't follow. Well, it's as if the first face had been a mask and he just didn't have the strength to keep it up any longer. Yes, you're right, it does sound unlikely. Uh, there's more. The second face, his real face, I'd swear to it, God help me, I knew that face too. You'd seen it before? It was the man with the eyes like a hawk. The man who tracked me across Scotland three years ago. The German agent who disguised himself as the first sea lord and stole the fleet battle plans from right under your nose. The 39 Steps affair. Mm -hmm. Well, you mean he's been impersonating Ivory? Maybe for years. Maybe there's never been a real Ivory and the man's past is as fake as the rest of him. That's a hideous thought. Here's another. He must have known who I really was, right from the first day in Biggleswick. He's been playing me like a fish on a line. <sighs> the devil he has. He's the man you've been watching, isn't he? It's Ivory who's been supplying the Germans with information. Yes, it is. Um, he's preposterous, but people like him. He flatters them and they tell him things. Well, it's been top level, but it's, it's, it's been damaging enough. Well, you can multiply that damage by about a thousand. What do you mean? Walter, this man can become anyone. 
He can fool anyone. He can be a politician, a soldier. He could be you if he chose, or me. What if Moxon Ivory has not been his only personality these last years? Ah, I take your point. Heaven alone knows how many top-level meetings he could have been to. For all we know, he's dined at Downing Street or Buckingham Palace. Well, if he's learned anything that crucial, he's not passed it on yet. We'd know if he had, believe me. And now we can pick him up and he'll never have the chance. It's excellent work, Dig. I'm afraid not. What do you mean? There's something I haven't told you. When I recognised him, I must have given myself away. He realised what had happened. I saw it in his eyes. He knows we're on to him. Mm. That's rather unfortunate. Unfortunate? It's a disaster. If I'm any judge, by now he'll be heading straight for Berlin with enough classified information to change the entire course of the war. Dear God, Walter. What have I done? In the past, I'd always come back to my old Park Lane flat with a great feeling of comfort. I liked to see my hunting trophies on the wall and sink into my own armchair. But not this time. Even after I'd had a hot bath, got back into my proper uniform and put a good dinner inside me, I felt no better. I was worried sick by the sense of being up against something, inhumanly formidable, wise and strong. And I was just about ready to admit defeat and chuck up the whole game. And then I noticed that one of the letters that had piled up while I'd been away was from Peter. Well, Dick, my old friend, I'm still here in the Bosch prison camp, but it seems like they're going to send me off somewhere else. They do that with the hopeless cases, and I suppose a sick old cripple like me comes fairly high up on the list, eh? Ah, oh, Peter... One of the other prisoners said I was very brave. Made me angry. I'm not brave. Not with the real courage, the big sort. The kind that you never let go of. Even when you're feeling empty inside and your blood's thin. I wish I did have that. Going on when it looks like everything's lost. I reckon that's about the biggest thing a man can do. Honey. Right. I'll be there in ten minutes. Come in, Dick. Walter. Oh. Hello, Miss Lamington. General Hannay. It's good to see you again. Walter, when Gresson met the German in that cave, I overheard more of their conversation than I told you. Well, why didn't you put it in your report? I ran out of paper. Listen. Ivory is involved with two organisations. The caged birds and the wild birds. Does that mean anything to you? Not a thing. No. Mary? I'm afraid not. All right. What about this name? Bomertz. Bomertz. Sounds Dutch. No, I'm sorry. Hmm. No. Well, but at least it gives us something to work with. I'll, I'll put my people onto it. Good man. Now, we have to think about his blind spot. What do you mean? <laughs> it's one of old Peter's theories. Every living creature has its blind spot. Doesn't matter how clever it is or how alert, there's always one source of danger that it just can't see. Find that one spot, and you've got cover better than any bush or rock. And then, Dick, you move in for the kill. In Mr. Standfast by John Buchan, dramatised by Bert Cools, Richard Hannay was played by David Robb, Sir Walter Bullivant by Clive Merrison, Moxon Ivory, Struan Roger, Mary Lamington, Jasmine Hyde, Peter Pienaar, John Glover, Lancelot Wake, Thomas Arnold, Abel Gresson, John Garasio, Mr. Ryer, Brian McRoberts, 
Miss Claire Liza Sadovy, Andrew Amos, John Stahl, George Broadbury, Peter Marinka, and Ted Broadbury, Ben Crow. Other parts were played by the cast. The director was Bruce Young. Walter, this man Ivory is a genius in disguise. He can become anyone. He can fool anyone. Heaven alone knows how many top-level meetings he's been to. Well, if he has learned anything crucial, he's not passed it on yet. Or we'd know if he had, believe me. Now we can pick him up and he'll never have the chance. <laughs> yeah, it's excellent work, Dick. I'm afraid not. What do you mean? When I recognized him, I must have given myself away. He realized what had happened. I saw it in his eyes. He knows we're on to him. And if I'm any judge, right now he'll be heading straight for Berlin with enough classified information to change the entire course of the war. Dear God, Walter, what have I done? Mr. Standfast by John Buchan. Dramatized by Bert Cools. Episode 2. In the past, I'd always come back to my old Park Lane flat with a great feeling of comfort. I liked to see my hunting trophies on the wall and sink into my own armchair. But not this time. Listen, Ivory's involved with two organisations. The Caged Birds and the Wild Birds. Does that mean anything to you? Not a thing. Hmm. Mary? I'm afraid not. All right. What about this name? Bommerts. Bommerts. Sounds Dutch. No, I'm sorry. Hmm. No. Well, but at least it gives us something to work with. I'll, I'll put my people onto it. Good man. Now, we have to think about his blind spot. What do you mean? <laughs> it's one of old Peter's theories. Every living creature has its blind spot. Doesn't matter how clever it is or how alert... There's always one source of danger that it just can't see. Find that one spot, and you've got cover better than any bush or rock. And then, Dick, you move in for the kill. And I'll tell you just what Ivory's blind spot is. It's me. I'm the one person in the world he can't fool with his disguises. But he did fool you at first. Because I wasn't looking for him then. I'm on my guard now. I'll always be able to recognise him. I can't explain why, but I know I'm right. Excellent, excellent. And that's not his only weakness. Oh? When you saw him in that tube station, you said he was terrified. Good Lord, that's right. How the deuce could I have forgotten? Well, he's obviously not a man who scares easily, so this, this, this must be some fundamental flaw, mm. a soft spot in his brain that, that something about the air raid triggered. Mm. Now, let's see, uh, the air raid, the, um, the crowd, the noise, confined space, I well, it, it's hard to know, but it, it's something to bear in mind, even if we can't make use of it. It proves he's not invincible. Well said. Mm. I might have something. My dear? I think I caught a glimpse of the real man, too. The man behind the mask. Huh? When was this? Last week. His face didn't change, but suddenly, just for a moment, he wasn't Mox and Ivory anymore. He was someone deeper, more real, more truthful. Mm, yes, that's exactly how I felt. He said something to me then, and I honestly believe he really meant it. What was it he said? He said he loved me, and he asked me to marry him. The caged birds, the wild birds. We're dealing with a poet. Did you read The Pilgrim's Progress? Yes, I did. You were right. It's a good book. I think we're playing out the same story. A great quest with a glorious prize at the end of it. Peace, you mean? Peace? 
a better world, lots of things. But it's a long way to the Celestial City. We'll make it, Miss Lamington. Yes. I think we shall. We must. Now you don't have to shadow Ivory. What will you do? I'm going to volunteer as a nurse. Good for you. I uh, suppose you're going back to France. Back to my regiment, yes. Back to the fighting. Shall we meet again, do you think? I think it's very likely. Then I shan't say goodbye. Good night, Miss Lamington. Good night, General Hannay. I returned to the front on September the 13th, 1917. The thing was desperately grave, and our prospects were none too bright. The Bosch was getting uppish, and with some cause. I won't enlarge on the fighting. It wasn't very distinguished. As far as my personal quest was concerned, there was only one occurrence of any real note. Hospital. Stopped a bit of shell with my head. Lots of blood, but no real damage done. Good Lord, man. You're not tying up a direct line to London just to tell me that you're all right. Of course not. A chap here was in Boulogne last week. Says he saw someone he recognised from back home in Glasgow. Abel Gresson. Ah, well, he probably did. Gresson's over there with the latest party of Labour delegates seeing the war firsthand. Are you serious? I assumed he'd been arrested and interned at the very least. Oh, I thought there was a chance he might try to contact our mutual friend. And? Huh? Seems he's been behaving himself perfectly. I see. Any progress on those other matters? Not yet. Now you're still in one piece, Dick. Hmm. I'd trust Walter Bullivant with my life, but he hadn't met the man. If Gresson had been behaving himself, I was odds-on favourite for the next Pope. The medical chaps fussed about it, but as soon as I could, I discharged myself and motored over to GHQ. I wanted to see the chap in charge of those inspection tours. Amelia Gore Booth, General. And do please say it. You weren't expecting a woman. Well... Oh, I'm used to it. We seem to be acceptable over here as nurses, but that's about the limit. We are capable of other things, you know. Oh, believe me, I'm well aware of it. Well, I wish you'd spread the word. Now, what was this information you wanted? I'm interested in someone who was on the most recent Labour visit, an American, name of Gresson. Ah, yes. Quiet, well-mannered sort of chap. Apparently, he stood on Vimy Ridge and wept. Wept? 170,000 dead, General, and God knows how many of theirs. That ought to make any man weep, don't you think? We had to gain the ground. Well, you succeeded. Congratulations. Is that everything? Did Gresson blot his copybook at all? Not once. Unless you count missing one of the visits I'd planned. What happened? He was taken ill on the road. Had to be left in a village and picked up on the way back. Where was that? Do you remember? Of course I remember tiny little place called Ocourt St. Anne. There it is, sir. Just north of Douvecourt. Slap bang on the main route to the Picardy Front. There'll be troops and transports through there every hour of the day. Yeah, not the place for a quiet life. No, but just the spot for a bit of espionage. All right, Forbes. Back to HQ. Sir. <laughs> Hannay, your note received. Gresson illness confirmed genuine, now under doctor in England. 
Stop at Strategic Village, probably coincidence, but your suspicion noted. Good work. B. Ouf. Uh, you are, Monsieur le Général. Okoro Santan. Thank you, Monsieur le Prefect. Some of these records go back several hundred years. Mm -hmm. The hamlet itself is of little note. The only feature of any interest is the chateau. Ah, yes, uh, here. Thank you. It, it dates from before Agincourt, but it fell into ruin and was rebuilt by an American. Mm. Mm. Just enough to rent it out and make money. Americans. <laughs> Quite a list of tenants over the years. Uh, they come for the shooting of the rouse. Yeah. Mm. American, English, French. Why did it stop? Oh, he did not stop, monsieur. Well, the last entry is 1912. Uh, impossible. Uh, show, show me. You see? Ah. <laughs> Some member seal must have been asleep. I remember it well. In 1913, the chateau was taken by a maker of wool from Lille. He has the lease for uh, five years. He lives there? No, no, no. He visits only seldom. Is he there now? No, no, no. The place is empty. <laughs> Closed up. Merde. I have to do everything myself. His name has to be on the register. Jacques Bormerts. Good Lord. Hello, General. I found another candle. Good work. Hang on. That's better. Oh, yes. Now, what on earth are you doing here? I didn't even know you were in France. I'm working at Duvecourt Hospital, and I discovered who's renting this chateau. Ah, the mysterious Monsieur Bommertz. Ah, you've been busy too. How did you find out? It's a long story. Then tell me later. I don't want to hang around here more than I have to. There's something about this place. Yes, it deserves the fire from heaven. Have you found anything? This is the only room that isn't closed up. Look at this desk. It's empty. But you see this. This panel doesn't match the others. I think it's a secret compartment, but I couldn't open it. Oh, let me have a shot. <laughs> Is that the uh, the military approach? Simple but effective. Is there anything in there? An attaché case. Mm. Here. Do you want a hairpin? Uh, it's not locked. Looks like pages from newspapers. Mm. Some notes. And this. Is it a money bag? No, it's not. Listen, I want you to do exactly as I tell you. Why? What's wrong? Move away very slowly, right away. But why? Please just do it. Yes, y yes, of course. Bosh, filth. Do you need some more light? For God's sake, don't talk. Don't breathe. <sighs> All right. It's safe. You can come back. What on earth is it? 
The Hun have been dropping it from their planes. It's anthrax powder. Oh, my dear lord. I don't know what it's doing here. I think I do. There. Look. It didn't mean much before, but now... I'm right, aren't I? Yes, you are. It's some sort of laboratory. And all those rows of jars. Bombers is refining anthrax powder by the barrelful. What lucky star made you look in there? I noticed the lock. Who puts a new padlock on a tumble-down old outhouse? <laughs> Superb work, Miss Lamington. Thank you. Shh. What? I thought I heard... Listen. Yes. This is a car. Perhaps I'll just go past. I don't think so. Come on. I've got the keys. I did the best I could with the panel. Quiet now. It's a transformer. Must be one of those big portable lamps. Exactement comme vous l'avez commandé, Monsieur Bomets. Bomets! I'm going to take a squint through the keyhole. Be careful. Stay in here. Whatever happens, keep back out of sight. What are you going to do? This. Que faites-vous? Deposez votre arme. Good evening. This is an odd place to meet again, Mr. Ivory. Vous savez quoi faire? Oui. Ivory, you, woman, put that light back on. Au revoir, Monsieur Hanné. Ivory. Ivory. Damn. Blistering hell and damnation. The woman's got away too, I'm afraid. I tried to follow her. But this place is like a warren. She's probably just a servant. Not important. Oh. So, Bomet is Ivory. Or I suppose they're both someone else. Whoever he really is. Was it another new face? Completely. But I was right. He couldn't fool me. I should have shot him the moment I laid eyes on him. Except you couldn't have done that, could you? Enemy or not, you had to give him a sporting chance. I was a fool. Oh, no, you weren't. Come on. Let's get somewhere more civilised. Ready? More than ready. First light tomorrow, I'm coming back here with a party of squaddies in gas masks to take care of that powder. Stop the car! Stop! What's the matter? I should have kept after her. The old woman? Why? Look. It must have been their emergency plan. Destroying the evidence. The fire from heaven. out there. You've never been out after dark. If old matron misery finds oh. out. What would she do? Mary Lamington. Get lost for a bit, Daff. There's a dear. You can't bring a man in here. I'll do the same for you someday, all right. I'll never get that lucky. Oh, come on, Daff. <laughs> oh, well, look at the time. Time to get back to work. Don't eat all the biscuits. I think I just ruined your reputation. Hmm. Enhanced it, more likely. That's better. Now, let's see what we've got. Mm, I was right. Newspaper pages. Frankfurter Zeitung. Der Grosse Krieg. Some French ones. Italian and British, too. Just single pages. Why would Ivory have these? Look, 
Gusseter's deep breathing system. Abolish all ills, mental, moral and physical. What about it? Gusseter's Tifa Ackman system. Sistema di respirazione profondo. You're right. It's on every one. The same advertisement. Mm -hmm. Dashed odd with a war on? Oh, it's been happening for weeks. You knew about it? Each time it appears, it's slightly different. We think there are hidden messages, but none of Walter's chaps can figure them out. It's a real enigma. Did you know that Ivory was involved? No. It means they're even more important than we thought. What have you got there? Oh, it's just pages of gibberish. Words, numbers, dates, formulas. What do you make of it? Oh, my gosh. You know what it is? We have to get this to Walter straight away. I think it's the key to the code. The case went off to London, and barely a week later I was out of uniform again with new orders. Report for special duties to Paris. This is a surprise. Can you really afford to be away from your desk? Well, does the department good to be rid of me for a spell? It keeps them on their toes, wondering just when I'll get back. Now, let me bring you up to date. Is it uh, safe to talk here? Maxine? <laughs> Safest place in the world. If you want to give a secret, talk about it in the middle of a crowd. <laughs> to the end of the war. The end of the war. Now... Your sickly friend, Mr. Abel Gresson. Let me guess. He's made a miraculous recovery. Not exactly. Aim! Fire! That's quite a step from letting him motor his way around France. What happened? We decoded the messages. So it was the key. What did you learn? They turned out to be the intimate correspondence of the wild birds. You've pinned them down at last. Yeah. Grissom was a member. We pulled him in for questioning, but I'm afraid he wasn't feeling chatty. But who are they? Or do I mean what? The Germans have hundreds of spies spread out all over Europe. We've known about them for years, of course, but we've only just cottoned on to their code name. They're the Stubenvogel. The caged birds. It's a good label. They can't make a single move without specific orders from Berlin. But there are others, agents who are outside the bars. They're so top secret they don't even know each other's real names. And they're licensed to act on their own initiative. The wild birds fly free. Recruited from all nations, supremely intelligent and deadly dangerous. For the first time ever, they're about to gather. They're coming together from all over the world. A joint operation. Uh, either that, or a pooling of knowledge too sensitive even for the code. Either way, it's been organised by that top man. Ivory running the show, with forces like that. And God knows what intelligence he picked up in England. Walter, it doesn't bear thinking about. Oh, I agree. That's why Ivory has to die. Mm. Ah, here comes the food. How are you going to find him? After the business of the chateau, he'll have gone to ground again. He's been in touch with Mary. What? In the old disguise. Plump and ridiculous as ever. He came to her three days ago at the hospital in Dufbourg. What did he want? Well, it seems she was right about his sincerity. He proposed to her again. The devil he did. Tell me she sent him away with a flea in his ear. She asked for time to think about it. <laughs> I don't suppose that went down very well. Actually, he didn't seem to mind. He told her he was off on a long business trip and he'd contact her again when he got back. Convenient for us, don't you think? You can't be setting up a trap with her as the bait. Well, I'll grant you it isn't pretty, but war isn't pretty. <sighs> Nothing we do is pretty. Not pretty? For God's sake, suppose he gets wind of who she really is. How can you put her in danger like that? Dick, have you ever thought about the effect the war's had on a lot of women? I can't say I have, no. Then let me tell you. Mary Lamington's 18 years old. If things had been different, she probably would have turned into a sort of silly, simpering debutante who blushes when she's spoken to. But thanks to this war, she's seen real life. And death, too. She stood side by side with agony and triumph. And you've seen what that's done to her. How superb it's made her. Now she has a chance to do a great service for her country. Would you deny her that? No. 
No, of course not. I'm glad to hear it. And there's one more thing you should know. What? It was Mary herself who came up with the plan. While Mary was waiting for Ivory's return, I had my own rather humbler job to do. I was on the move again, this time to Switzerland. Hey! Use the station master! Yes? I've got this! Tells me where to go. Uh, then go there and be quick about it. I can't read it. Oh, gosh. Let me see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the woman will take you. Uh, woman! Where are you from? Arosa. Don't I have soap in Arosa? Joseph Zimmer of Arosa was the beneficiary of an old Swiss philanthropist who'd been kind enough to find him a job where his simple skills could be put to good use. But he wasn't particularly grateful. Can you cook? Well enough. Clean, wash clothes? Woman's work. This it? Keep your voice down. This is all you need. There's food in there and fuel. Water from the pump. You want anything else? I'm at the station, right? Right. Go. No soap. No manners. <sighs> right. Mm. Hello? <laughs> what? Hello, Peter. <laughs> Dick. That's a bloody good story. Yes, I thought you'd like it. But now I want to hear yours. I was supposed to go back to England, but something went wrong with the paperwork, they said. So I finished up in this place instead. How long ago? Oh, just a few days. I thought so. That's Bullivan's doing. You're almost back on the front line, old friend. What do you mean? The wild birds are meeting here, in this village. They're coming here? But we don't know when. I'm here to spy out the land and wait for developments. You're my camouflage. <laughs> What's so funny? I never thought I'd see the day you were my servant. Well, I never thought I'd see the day you needed one. Oh, well, these things happen. Tell me about this man, Ivory. Hmm. He sounds a bad one. The worst. We have to get him into Italy so he can be dealt with on the Allied soil. Hmm. Will you do that? With a girl. Uh. When he goes to Duvecourt to see her, they'll tell him she's gone to the inn at Santa Chiara, just across the border from here. And then... A lure to catch a lion. Uh -huh. Just like the old days, eh? <laughs> Dick, my friend. What? Try and find some way I can help, won't you? We fell into an easy routine. Every morning I'd lift Peter into his bath chair and take him down into the village or round the lake, and we'd both look out for anything suspicious. In the afternoons, we'd wrap ourselves up and sit outside the cottage and talk about the war. Oh, tell me about the big battles. Have they got Lynch yet? No, he's still flying. <laughs> he's a white man, that one. After he shot me down, he came to see me in the hospital. Said he was sorry I was lame, because he'd look forward to more fights with me. <laughs> Easy. Oh, it's all right. It comes and goes. <laughs> oh, yes. He's a good man, for a German. And every evening I'd cook our dinner, and we'd smoke our pipes, and yarn about old friends and old hunts. Sometimes I'd pick up one of his two precious books and read to him. And behold, they saw, as they thought, a man upon his knees with hands and eyes lifted up. And as soon as Mr. Honest saw him, he said, I know this man. And Mr. Valiant for truth says, what's his name? I swear you've learned this by heart. <laughs> and Mr. Valiant for truth, I reckon he's the greatest man I know. Him and old Billy Strang, who was with me in 92 in Mashana land. Until a lion got him. They say you can find everyone you know in this book. That's true. You, your ivory, even me. But... I'm not one of the great ones. 
Maybe I'm Mr. Standfast. He was poor too, and he didn't like women much. And Mr. Honest said his name is Standfast, and he is a right good pilgrim. And at night, after I'd put Peter to bed, I'd slip outdoors and have a run, up through the snow-laden pines to the ridges, till I stood on a crest with a frozen world at my feet. And my gaze always was south, for beyond a peak with a point like a needle lay the Staub Pass, and just beyond that was Italy and Mary. Nearly ready. Dick, someone's outside. Who's there? What do you want? You've got a parcel. Here. If it's food, I hope it chokes you. Ah. What is it? Posted in Arosa. Nice touch, Walter. New socks from Joseph's auntie, so thoughtful. <laughs> and inside the socks, away from inquisitive eyes. One of the wild birds has been brought down. An American agent has taken his place. Their rendezvous is an empty house called the Pink Chalet. Meet him there on the 13th at 9.15 p.m. He knows your real name. His is Clarence Dunn. Destroy this note. B. Richard Hanny. Done. The same. Follow me, mister. This way. Now stick close. Can we have some light? No, no, it's too risky. We'll have to feel our way. Come on. Okay, we should be safe now. Get the light, will you? Switch is on the left. Where? Uh, ah, got it. Oh, what the hell? Dan! Dan, keep back! It's a trap! A trap? I can't bloody well move! Well, goddamn them filthy bosh. You simply can't. Trust them at all, can you, old man? Ivory. For almost the final time, thank God. I'm so tired of that ridiculous posturing fool. Henceforth, you may address me as the Count von Schwabing. So that's who you really are. I might have known. What precisely do you mean by that? Count Otto von Schwabing. You will speak that name with respect. Respect? For the most notorious name in all Germany? How did it feel, Count, when the scandal broke and you couldn't show your face in any civilized country in Europe? It was a minor setback, nothing more. Shall we uh, have some light? Oh. Ah. And as with all minor setbacks, a solution was quickly found. I have dined with your king. Did you know that? Also your prime minister, a man of the most unbelievable tedium, but so useful, so informative. And thanks to him and to others like him, I have proved my worth to the fatherland and my past is forgotten. My exile is at an end and I'm about to take my rightful place once again. Whatever it is you're up to, you'll be stopped. <laughs> By you? Don't flatter yourself. At any moment during the past nine months, I could have put an end to you with a mere nod of my head. Bluff! And the note that so easily lured you here tonight, was that bluff? You wrote that. Meet him there on the 13th at 9.15 p.m. He knows your real name. <laughs> I could become him in person if I wished it. The copy's handwriting was, uh, was elementary. You'll never win this war. 
You're as good as beaten already! And now who is bluffing, eh? Three days from now, thanks to the efforts of myself and my associates, we shall be in a position to utterly destroy the entire right wing of the British Army. In a week, Boulogne and Calais shall be ours, and then Paris. And after that, there shall be peace. God! Why do I tell you these things? It is because your life is over, my dear General. But uh, not just yet. There is one last sight I wish you to enjoy before the end. I'm going now on a little journey, and when I return, I shall have a companion. A certain pretty lady. Stop! You chur! She loathes the sight of you! She'll never go anywhere with you! Oh, I think she will. She is an innocent child, and I shall explain to her that she has been a tool in the clumsy hands of your friends. You really think that, do you? You blind fool. She's been working with us from the first. You say so? Hmm. Well, that is, uh, vexing, but it will make no difference. I have worked hard, and I am entitled to my pleasure, whether it is given willingly or no. God! You! Futile. Goodbye for now, my dear General. I hope you uh, find the darkness restful. Auf Wiedersehen. Happily, it's just as difficult to be a coward as it is to be a hero. I don't know how long it took, but eventually it came to me, there in the pitch blackness, that this infernal device had to be like everything else on the planet. It had to have its weak point. Come on, Harry, think. Think. You saw it while the lights were on. Wooden framework. Chains. Weights. Came down from the ceiling. Did it come straight down? No, nope. tighter on one side. It's hinged. So, there must be a clasp, a catch, something holding it shut. <laughs> well, I'm not beaten yet, von Schwabing. It was like something out of Conan Doyle. I gathered all my strength to leap to freedom and discovered that my right arm was the only part of me I could move. What's that they say about counting chickens? Ah, just a tick. I offered heartfelt thanks to the genius who invented the portable electric torch. By its feeble beam I examined the thing that was on top of me. The catch I dislodged was one of a dozen or more. Blast! Ah! There was a master clamp. A single massive metal lever. Spring that, and I'd spring myself. And my torch wasn't the only thing I got in my pocket. Nearly. This time. And I was free. I'd assumed that the chalet was empty and that I'd been left to rot alone. I was mistaken. Hello? Ah. In the forest, 
The little birds fall silent. Just wait, for soon you too shall be at rest. Uh, come in, warm yourself, take a drink. We're the first, you and I. I must see the leader. Where is he? He's gone across into Italy. I have to see him at once. Uh, he'll be back tomorrow night. But that's too late. This is a matter of life and death. Can you drive a car? And so I found myself in a mighty Daimler with a forged frontier pass in my pocket. Both of them courtesy of an obliging wild bird. If Ivory wasn't expected back until tomorrow night, it meant he'd other business to attend to than just collecting Mary. Please God I might still be in time. Yes, signore. Miss Lamington. Ah, come inside. Ah, General Hannay. Are you alone? Is there anyone else here? The others are on their way. The weather's held them up. You have to come with me. What? The, the plan? Everything's changed. Get your things. Hurry. Well I don't understand. I'm sorry, but I had to get you away. Ivory could have been there any minute. Already, but... You weren't expecting him until tomorrow, yes, I know. Somehow he got wind of the plan. God knows how. Where are we going? Switzerland. St. Anton. What about the others? I left a note at the inn. So he's escaped us again. Now of all times. Oh, it's a catastrophe. Yes, Mary. I'm afraid it is. Yes. Good. What's the matter? I was expecting someone to be here. Who? Oh, Peter, of course. It, yes, Peter. Now, where's he run off to? Right. I think this has gone on quite long enough. Don't you? Where was I in error? <laughs> I'm afraid that's something you'll have to work out for yourself. It's of no consequence. The time for games is past. When General Hannay catches up with you, will you kindly stop looking at me like that? You know, it, it is a pity. I really did love you. I detest you and everything you stand for. Yes, that's what Hannay said to me. You've been with him? Last night. Soon I'll take you to see him, but, but not just yet. Where is he? We had an interesting little conversation. Would you like to know what I told him? Well? That I've laboured long and deserve to take my reward. You wouldn't dare. Oh, you are mistaken, my dear. And really, I see no need to wait any longer. <gasps> Get away from her, cunt! Oh, Dick! Good evening, Miss Lamington. I'm waiting, von Schwabing. Oh, of course. Congratulations, Hannay. You are more resourceful than I should have thought. Thank you. But you suffer from a severe handicap. You have the morals of an English gentleman. You stand there with your gun aimed at my heart and you cannot pull the trigger. You see? And if it comes to a contest between us, well, forgive me, my dear General, but uh, you seem to be <laughs> positively exhausted. What have you been up to? None of your dashed business. As you please. But it seems to me that I can get away from you now just as easily as I did once before. And the next time I advise you not to come charging to the rescue alone. Is not alone. Peter! And I'm no English gentleman. You bloody Bosch murderer! Whereas I am. Walter! So, I'd have to let my less inhibited friend there do the actual shooting. Just say the word. No, you, you, you cannot shoot me here. This is neutral ground. 
a demand to be handed over to the Swiss authorities. No, I don't think so. Terribly unfair to give them the burden. Wouldn't you say so, Dick? Terribly. Then what is to happen to me? If you're going to kill me, be, be so good as to get on with it. We're not going to kill you. It's no longer necessary. You'll have a fair trial. I see. But first... Dick? This man sent millions of honest folk to their graves. It's his sort that made the war, not the brave, stupid, bosh fighting men. And I don't think he's ever been in sight of a shell in his life. I say we take him to the front line. I say we make him see what war really is. Excellent notion, Dick. I'll make sure he's guarded night and day. He won't slip through our fingers again. Now, I must get in touch with GHQ. He told me about this grand plan of theirs. Mm, a surprise attack on the whole right wing. We picked up most of the wild birds on their way here. Several of them felt like talking. It's all been passed on to the Commander-in-Chief. So the plan's been foiled? Yep, you can't go that far, I'm afraid. And without Ivory's chums and their information, we should have blunted its claws, at least. Well, let's hope so. Well done, Walter. Hmm. Well, von Schwabing was right. They do look done in. Now, let's get back inside. Is he gone? Safely away. Walter conjured some troops out of thin air. Just one of my many talents. Oh, come and try this brandy, Dick. <laughs> Walter. Ah, oh, the end of the war. Hmm. The end, the end, end of, of the war. war. <clears throat> Speaking of appearing out of thin air... When you didn't come back, I, I got worried. Thought maybe I ought to go get help. I found him crawling his way to the station through the snow. Bless you, Peter. But what the deuce are you doing here? I came to pick you up and take you to Santa Chiara for the operation. Of course, we didn't know that Ivory was several steps ahead of us. How did you find out? Well, he broke into this place and discovered one of the wild birds sitting by the fire, drinking this excellent brandy and listening to an extremely poor performance of the Blue Danube. <laughs> <laughs> he decided to tell us what was going on. And you lay in wait for us. He's good at that. Very good. I'm looking forward to hearing exactly what happened in Italy. Not now. But why not? Well, because now, Mr. Pinar, I think we should take a proper look around this place and see what there is to be found. Really? Really. Uh, let me help you. Oh, oh, okay. uh, see you later, Dick. Here. Thank you. Uh. Miss Slavington. Oh, you, uh, you should be sitting down. Here. Let me help you. Thank you. Oh. Tell me what he did to you. He thought you were out of the picture. He was mistaken. That's all that matters. I followed him across the Alps. You went to the inn? I had to. He told me what he was planning to do, but I got there too late. So you had to drive all the way back again? I couldn't. Just as I got there, I skidded down a bank and wrecked the car. Oh, then how on earth did you get back here? Oh, God. I walked. Uh, that's the most... Thank you. Thank you so much. Walter was right. Even without the wild birds' information, the Germans still mounted their massive push. I was back with my old division, but there was precious little of it left. Things hadn't been going well, and there were parts of the line we were holding with no more than a man every three yards or so. Thank God the enemy hadn't learned how desperate things were. One concentrated attack in the right place, and that would have been it. But our pilots were magnificent, driving back the German scout planes before they had a chance to spy out the truth. 
Someone told me that Peter had asked to come into France and be billeted at one of the flying stations with his old comrades. I caught a glimpse of him on his way there, in a flying corps wagon with a batch of young lads, puffing his pipe and looking a mighty happy man. Well, well he's acting very strange, General. I don't think he knows where he is. Has he said anything? Not since they brought him here. Von Schwabing, can you hear me? I don't have time for this. Watch him like a hawk, Forbes. It might be a trick. Sir! Can they? What? Before the trial. What about it? Do the English t torture their prisoners? No. They're gentlemen. What's wrong with him, sir? He's lost everything he ever knew, Forbes. He's always been powerful. Always at the top. Now, he's nothing. I wasn't there when it happened. Von Schwabing had been moved again, right up into a battle zone. The sort where each side could almost reach out and grasp each other's hands. And somehow, he got away from his guards. Hilfe! Hilfe! Ich bin Deutsche! Deutsch! Ich bin gekracht von Schwabing! It was the German guns that got him. Right. Right. Yes, I understand. Thank you, sir. Hane out. General? It's not good. The French can't get here for another six hours. Six hours? We'll have to spread the men out even thinner. And keep the mobile guns shifting. Keep up the illusion. Sir. Chin up, man. We're not beaten yet. General Hane, sir. Yes? You'd better come outside, sir. Well? There, sir. Where? Oh, my God. It's Lynch. General? Black plane, wings swept back. It's Lynch, that top flyer after von Richthofen. No wonder he got through. He's getting a damn good deco. Where are our boys? The Bosch must be keeping them well away. If Lynch makes it back and reports, it's all up for us. Look! He's one of ours! It was tiny and painfully slow. It must have been a reserve plane, a trainer, something. But by God, its pilot was a battler. And then, suddenly, our man broke off the chase and started to climb, higher and higher, till I marveled that the pilot could still be breathing. It was then that I realized. He's running away. No, he's not. Then what's he doing? He's found Lynch's blind spot. Oh, my God! He's going to ram him! Bloody fool! No, no! There had been only one way to make sure of the kill, and he'd taken it. Two heroes had fought their last battle, and we were saved. They fell just short of the enemy lines, but I didn't see them. My eyes were blinded with tears, and I was on my knees. When they took Peter from the wreckage, death had smoothed out some of the age in him, and left his face much as I remembered it, so long ago in the Mashonaland hills. We held the front till the French arrived in force and relieved us. As I marched what was left of my division away from the battlefield, the enemy guns were still speaking behind us, but I didn't heed them. I buried Peter in the lee of an apple orchard on the evening of a glorious spring day. Peter had a hero, a great man. I tried to tell him once that he was very like him, but he wouldn't have it. They found this in his pocket after the crash. <clears throat> And Mr. Valiant for Truth said, I am going now to my father's, and I do not repent me of all the trouble I have been at to arrive where I am now. My sword I give to him that shall succeed me in my pilgrimage, and my courage and skill to him that can get it. My marks and scars I carry with me to be a witness that I have fought his battles 
who now will be my rewarder. So he passed over, and all the trumpets sounded for him on the other side. That was beautiful. It was his favorite passage. This is a lovely spot. It reminds me a bit of the garden at my aunt's house. Do you remember? Where we met. <laughs> I'll never forget it. I remember thinking, this garden, the scent of the may and the lilac, the sight of the hills, that feeling of eternity and peace and safety is what we're fighting for. Yes. Miss Lamington. General Hannay. Mary. Oh, dash it, I'm a soldier. I'm no good at this sort of thing. Then let me help you. Is that what you were trying to say? Yes. Yes, it was. Good. Why don't you tell me some more? In Mr. Standfast by John Buchan, dramatised by Bert Cools, Richard Hannay was played by David Robb, Sir Walter Bullivant by Clive Merrison, the Count von Schwabing, Struan Roger, Mary Lamington, Jasmine Hyde, Peter Pinar, John Glover, Mrs. Amelia Gorbooth, Brian Emmett Roberts, Forbes, Chris Pavlo, and the Prefect, Ben Onwukwe. Other parts were played by the cast. The director was... Bruce Young.